Hi, I'm Alex Howard, and welcome to Conscious Tea. My guest in the studio today is Nick Seneca Jankel. Hi, Nick. Hi. And Nick is a 21st century shaman and the author of the book Switch On. And in today's interview, we're going to be exploring what it means to be switched on and how you can be more switched on in your life. So, Nick, maybe as a starting point, what do we mean by being switched on? Well, there's many ways to answer that question. Um, I guess the simplest would be to say it's living from the experience of being connected to everything that there is in the universe and allowing that primary relationship to the rest of the, of the world and the universe as a whole to guide you in everything that you do. So it's really about living from what people would call enlightenment or awakening. Um, but I purposely don't use those kind of words because people often think, oh my God, that's something special that you get if you go for 10 years to India, but you don't get that when you're on the bus to uh, you know, Covent Garden. So the key thing for me is to really give people a different access point, a different language. And for yes. me, Switched On brings to mind the idea that we are one electrode, if you like, in a massive circuit board. Uh, which is the universe, which is every atom, um, every non-atom, um, every bit of vacuum, every bit of form that there is. And we're already wired up. Can't help it, part of being. Um, but when you switch on, you purposefully you choose, you consciously become aware of it, and you live from that place. And then you switch off again, more, more than likely. And, that, and that's one of the things that I think is very important for people to realize is that it's a conscious, active choice. Mm. Um, you don't sit there going, well, I guess everything's great. Um, and you may be able to do that in a monastery um, or um, up a mountain for 20 years, but we don't live in that world. Not most people I know don't. And life is a constant collection of challenges, some very tiny. You know, the guy doesn't give you a change on the bus or, or, you know, someone tries to cut you up. Or massive, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I've just had a kid. I have no idea how to be a mother or a father. And those challenges are what I believe are those, are the kind of invitations to switch on and move from a place of there's something wrong, something wrong with me, something wrong with the world, um, to a place of I don't know what it is yet, but something is perfect about this moment. Um, perfect in the sense that it may not end up looking brilliant. It may not end up making me rich. It may not end up making my life successful. But it's perfect in that there's something in this for me to grow, mm. to become more myself, uh, and more open, more loving, more caring, more thriving. Um, and for me, that's what switching on is. Um, but I do, I break it down, I make it a bit simpler because I was like, whoa, that sounds amazing, but how do I, oh, how do I get there? So I make it pretty practical. I'm, I believe in really practical philosophy, practical living in, in you know, this world. And so I split everything into, I split this incredible experience we have in our, in our minds and bodies at every second into three. And this has actually been going on for you know, millennia, this three way split. And for me, it's very simple it's heart. Head, hand. So heart is pretty obviously it's our emotions. It's our experiences of our feelings. Head is our thoughts, um, beliefs, ideas, and hands are the things we actually do, our actions and mm. behaviours. So for me, you can actually almost get to a point where you know whether those three are switched on or off, and which is on and off. And um, so a switched on heart is one that's feeling open, uh, safe, vulnerable, um, forgiving, loving, juicy. Uh, aware of the rich moment by moment feelings of life. A switched on head is one that is becoming more conscious of its belief systems and its thoughts and ideas and is looking for truth rather than convention or conditioning. And a switched on hand or switched on hands are those that are crafting uh, things that can be projects, it can be art, it can be children um, with love and care mm -hmm. and attention. So, very simple, switching on is about um, reconnecting your heart back to this amazing experience of, of uh, oneness, um, rewiring your brain to take use of all the advances in science we've had about how you actually can shift your brain, and then, crucially, 
making that count in the world by remixing whatever's in your, in your world. Yes. And, and I'm curious as to how this whole journey started for you. You know, yes. it's a journey, it sounds like a, of a number of years of kind of clarification <laughs> and, and, yes. and kind of self-work. What, what, what started it for you? Well, um, there are a number of sort of uh, rivers flowing into the ocean of my work. Um, one, you know, common to many people's lives in this, in this field, is experience of quite a lot of pain and suffering. Um, as a kid, a very early divorce, um, I was teased and bullied and uh, had a pretty horrible time at school. And that was just a whole load of basically daily embarrassments and humiliations and trauma. Um, and that really s s made me seek. I wanted a solution to that. So I had therapy when I was 13 uh, to 16. Not actually by choice. My mum suggested it. Um, and that's, that, that started really getting me interested in how I think. Mm -hmm. What's this doing? Mm -hmm. But what, there wasn't so much of a what's this doing, the heart. So a lot of psychotherapists would go, oh, 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 thoughts, and they were talking a lot. And meanwhile, my emotions were just all over the shop, um, as many teenagers are. Um, and um, I don't know, no one had any guide for me to, mm -hmm. to how to go into my heart. There were no sort of heart-led practices in my mm -hmm. family's life. Um, and a little bit of mysticism I kind of got involved in early on. But then around sort of 15, 16, and then onwards, I started getting more and more involved in uh, the clubbing scene, which became the rave scene um, in London um, in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And there, in that experience, you have this eight-hour period where you're switched on. Mm. Um, you can't even help it. It just happens. Right? Yeah. And you're I remember, in it. I remember reading at the start of your book that the first experience you had where it was like you experienced something you'd never really experienced Absolutely. before. Absolutely. And um, yes, yeah, so, so the very first time I was, I mean, literally probably 20 stone, I don't know, whatever that is in pounds, very overweight, um, NHS specs or something similar. Mm -hmm. um, so cheap, you know, cheap specs. Um, no idea about fashion. Uh, never had a girlfriend. Um, was not cool in any stretch of the word. I mean, I, had, I was involved in the, sort of the fun mm -hmm. crowd, but I was certainly by no means cool. And I went to an underground club in London um, and um, got involved with the scene. And um, literally, something happened to me. So the, the, the switching on was like, wow, I am connected to everyone. And uh, they seem to be smiling at me rather than you know, criticizing me. Mm. That's pretty amazing for a start. Smiling people, humans. Um, but there's something happened with the music as well. I'd already, always, already li always liked, um, I grew up listening to some of my dad's 70s folk and, and whatever. And in once in every album, there's usually like what I would know now as a breakbeat, um, mm -hmm. a syncopated rhythm. But I didn't know what that was. I was just like, this is a great track. I love this track. And I kind of listened to Soul to Soul a bit and, and some of the uh, hip hop. And, but I didn't really know what breakbeats were. Um, and then this club night was just basically a breakbeat night. Um, it was hardcore, it was the music of the time. And this thing, this break, this um, on the off rhythm just took my soul and I was dancing. And the way I think about it is in those moments, I wasn't dancing, I, I was the dance. Yes. Dance was experience, I was, I let go of all ego. Um, and that was a great teaching for me that mm -hmm. this is possible. The challenge then was why can't I keep this going on a Tuesday right. evening? How do you integrate that taste into your exactly. life? Exactly. So you, yeah. lots of people can have peak experiences and glimpse into this joyous oceanic oneness. And that's amazing and wonderful, and that's the start of the journey, definitely. Um, but the real work, um, which takes literally decades rather than a few weeks, is taking that into those micro-mundane moments where you react, where you're mm. feeling down, where you're feeling you know, self-indulgent, dramatic suffering of some sort. Um, and that's the way the work happens. And, and how, I'm curious how that was for you, kind of going from this kind of totally peak state, mm. which was kind of contrasted, it sounds like, against a quite painful, difficult kind of life at that time. How was that integration? Like what, what supported that? Or what, what kind of unfolded from well, that? Well, for many years... I don't think much supported it. I mean, actually, one thing, I spent a year in Africa mm. um, as an 18-year-old. I was uh, asked by my university before I went there to take a year off. I was like, okay, I don't know, really know how, why. Um, I ended up in Africa, like super rural Africa, with no support. There was no great system. And there was you know, no toilets, no electricity, nothing. And the only way I could get into it was to get into it, was to let go of mm -hmm. my sort of London hipster mindset and get really into the community. So that became actually a source of great support for me, was mm. this be able to, ability to connect with people on a bus, uh, make them laugh, have, a, have fun, and that really was a great nourishment. But in terms of my intellectual structures, my frameworks, didn't really have anything. 
Um, and I was at the time fiercely a- atheist. I, I'd sort of, mm-hmm. I'd, I hadn't found a mystical path that made sense. Didn't even know what there was. And I was super cynical and skeptical of anything new agey. And I was kind of obviously curious. And it was really until I had another kind of series of what I would call now breakdowns of some sort, physical, emotional, mental, um, that kept saying to me, hello, you still haven't got it. You've got bits of it, mm-hmm. but you haven't got it. Um, and most importantly, the thing you don't have is the ability to be able to switch on by choice. Yes. And that was what I wanted to, to, more than anything. Uh, after the final sort of uh, uh, breakdown, I burnt out, which mm-hmm. is a posh term for a, a breakdown, uh, running a, um, a kind of tech, internet, digital, dot-com startup that was very successful, except for my emotional state. And after about six years, I had a, what hopefully touch wood is the last breakdown of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was 29, 30, and I was like, this is it. I've got to, I've, I've got to, not only do I have to sort myself out so I can have all the, the resources within me, but I also need to make sure that my life's work, if I'm going to build a business again, which I am and I do, um, which I love, um, it has to be aligned with my true deepest heart and not someone else's ideas of what success yes. is. Yeah. What, as you kind of made that transition and as you kind of, you know, it sounds like you kind of recognized that switch on wasn't just something you could happen randomly, but you needed to bring that into your life. What supported you? And it's also a broader question of, of what supports people in being more switched on in their life. Great, great. I mean, I'm still, I guess I'm on that journey still. Mm. Um, one thing that really helps is a, a partner who is into it as right, you. And, sure. and that's like, uh, I actually had to, I didn't have to, I chose to end a relationship around that time with a woman I totally loved and still think is amazing. Um, uh, because sh- her and my life, journeys were just going off in totally mm-hmm. different directions and my wife uh today is you know she's a teacher healer and she's my co-conspirator co-coach co-everything we do we, she's a mirror she's a, uh, a guide i mean she actually also heals me she's a cranial sacral therapist mm-hmm. so she actually does healing on me um through many different ways so that's i think number one thing for me would be to find a partner um, and it could be a buddy or roommate. It doesn't have to necessarily be a <laughs> sure. romantic partner. Yes. But uh, I believe in peer-to-peer work. I believe, yes. in, I believe in the sort of buddy system in some, in a very powerful. And so I think number one thing is find someone who wants to go on the journey with you. Before her, her actually, the, um, there was a business partner of mine, and we also went on that journey together. And we spent about five years just talking about this stuff, literally 20 hours a day, trying everything, going on every course or whatever. So, that was, so I've always had, I think a buddy would be number one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Finding a reconnection practice um, that, that really works. Um, I tried breath work, I tried uh, qigong, I tried yoga, I tried um, embodied movement, five rhythms. I, you know, mm-hmm. and I like them all, so it's not like I choose, choose one. But it, I think it definitely helps to have one thing that you do, that you know reconnects you. And actually, the more you fire those nervous system pathways of that particular mm-hmm. one, and the more you, rem- you know what it's doing and you're consciously sort of building on it, the more it's, it's just so quick. Yes. Um, and so for some people, if you really don't do new age, then for some people, that's, that's a walk in nature. I mean, that, mm-hmm. you know, nature walk once a week. I mean, my father, who's um, a, a, a very committed atheist, he... Um, <laughs> not just an atheist, but a committed atheist. <laughs> Absolutely. He's not messing around. Um, he washes up. And, and dries up every night. Um, and I can see it's meditative for him, and he loves walking. Mm. So even though he is actually claiming to be totally uh, a-religious um, and uh, not spiritual, he still has a reconnection practice. Yes. He just doesn't. Kn- I don't think he re- understands that that's yes. what it's doing. Um, probably because his belief system won't allow him to. Um, and I think everyone has one. We just often don't stop doing them. So mm. because we get busy with the stuff. Um, so finding something, and it could be something from when you're a kid, uh, something from now. So I think a yeah, partner, a buddy, um, a practice, a reconnection practice, or more than one. Um, I guess another thing would be a, a fervently curious attitude. Um, I think curiosity is an is a amazing wisdom hack. It's, it sort of hacks uh, through anxiety and uh, self-reproach and judgment and criticism. Um, because you suddenly go, okay, well, that's what's going on, but what's the interesting bit here? What's mm-hmm. the, where's the juice? Where's the insight? Um, and that really is helpful. Uh, I think there's also an element which it can be quite uh, a challenging or, you know, uh, thing to do, which is to distance oneself, um, not necessarily in love, but in practicality from the people in your life who 
pull you more towards what I would call separation. Yes. Um, towards fear, towards you know one one upmanship, keeping up with the Joneses, and, all that kind of thing. And that's often, I think, one one of the challenges of people when they start to wake up or become switched on that yes. their friendships and their relationships are often with people that see the world in the way they used to see the world. And then someone starts to challenge their perceptions and yeah. see it differently. And they tend to then move away from those people. And that's yeah. challenging on both sides because it those is. people often try and pull us back, not because they don't love us, but because they do love us and they miss Absolutely. us. And they, but then of course, we also want to move forwards. And I'm wondering what you see supports that transition. And, to, and often it can be quite lonely, I think, when someone first goes on a path, especially if they haven't got that buddy. Yes. So what do what, what, what you feel supports I think there's, I mean, that? There's, yeah, there's a couple of things there I think that's very, very important, actually. And I think it's not really talked about as much mm. in the seeking space, um, which is our friends do love us um, and we love them. And saying, it's not saying goodbye, it's saying, you know, see you later, so see you soon. You know, I'm not going to spend as much time with you mm. because this is what my world's about now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very open to all my friends. I'm like, come with me on this journey. If I'm always available. You know, you want to come into this world with me, I'm here. I'm never going to say goodbye to you. I love you. I think you're awesome. Um, yeah, I choose to focus time on the relationships that are helping me grow and me move forward. Um, but I think a lot of your, one's friends often, totally by not, by not, not by thinking about it, pull us back into the person we were because that's mm. who they knew. Right. Um, because, and they love that person. And they love that person. Yeah. Whereas actually, it's often, I, I also want to say to a lot of people I know, which is, hey guys, I'm here. I'm like, this is me now. <laughs> this is, mm. And I think I'm a lot more fun to be with. I'm even more lovable um, now. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got a lot less stuff. Um, and, you know, let's go and have some fun. Um, but it may not be in the same way we used to. Yes. Um, and, you know, if we're going to sort of critique people for three hours in a club, I'm just not interested um so i think that's it, it is it is challenging i think the other thing the flip side obviously is is well consciousness uh abhors a vacuum so if there's if there's no friends uh then you will something will happen you know you need to you need to fill that space mm. um so i think it's very important to consciously and intentionally put into your experience the idea of building a community for yourself with people who do get it, who want to be switched mm. on, who th that's their choice. They've realized that's the number one thing that can help both them and the world thrive. So that's their priority. And mm. once you find those people, you start to realize they're everywhere for a start, right. particularly these days. I mean, the world has just part people are open, what I call love curious. They're, you know, the the same people have been high in a rave or out in nature or out in Peru doing uh, ayahuasca. That there's such an upswell now um, that they're there. There are lots of people who are really interested and who won't criticize and won't be cynical and won't sort of dig. Mm. Um, and I mean, my, my sort of uh, vibe is to build a community, you know, and the business I, I run now, in starting Ripe and Ready, is in many ways a way of saying, this is my community. Mm. I want a community for myself, uh, a global community of uh, conscious, loving, um, joyful, fun world changers. Mm. Um, and, you know, let's put a flag in and let's bring them to us. Mm. I like it. Mm. I like it. And I, I'm curious as to what, like what practices have, have most supported you? You know, I, well, either that you see mm. being mo of most value to others or indeed practices that you followed that have, have helped you be more switched on. Well, there's a micro practice that I do every day, um, which people would probably call it meditation. Mm -hmm. um, it's not meditation in the sense that if you filmed me, you wouldn't see me sitting on a meditation seat. Um, with a gong or, you know, in a mudra. Um, it's a very active, sort of almost like advanced processing. Um, and so basically when I go to bed, um, and sometimes during the day and often in the mornings too, I will spend 10, 15 minutes in a kind of hypnotherapeutic meditative uh, deep state, um, which is actually relatively easy to get into once you get into a little bit of practice. Um, and then I will almost scan my life for things that are pulling me out of being switched on. So I will find any challenge, threat, worry, something I said, something they said, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I will actually in that moment go, how can I almost, literally, I guess, um, or metaphorically, or both melt my nervous system into love so that I can accept this and, and take it in somehow and make it part of me and not be... Uh, defense, defending mm. against it. Um, so that for me is my number one practice. That's the thing that keeps me rooted and grounded in this world. Uh, and so, you know, if I 
mess up or, or doing a speech or if I have an interaction and it's a little bit uncool with someone, I'll do it there and then. You know, I'll, I'll mm. sp- go off in a few minutes and I'll go, okay, what, who was I being? What did I do to cause this? What, what, how did I co-create it? What, 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 did, mm. what part of me wasn't switched on? Um, and now, and now I'm aware of this. What um, do I have to let go of? Usually, a thought, a belief, a feeling that will allow me to be at peace with this reality. Um, so that for me is the number one thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then everything else is a kind of uh, you know benef- comes from that. Um, another thing actually that I, I often almost feel the opposite. If I don't do it, I don't start noticing it. Like I start getting a bit freaky is dancing, um, which is actually more challenging now because I don't go out raving that much. It's right. hard to get out with two small children and, and a life that's very rich and full. And I do miss that. So we do a lot of raving in, our, in, the, in the living room. Uh, <laughs> got okay. my, my kids, my five-year-olds are going, it's the drop, Dad, it's the drop. <laughs> um, so I think, dan- and my wife's a dancer. So we okay. dance a lot. And that for me uh, is, you know, without that, I start to sort of almost like air. You know, I'm yeah. like, oh, I can't breathe. Okay, what's going on? Oh, got to dance, you know. Yeah. Got to move. Okay. And I'm, I'm wondering also what you see gets in the way of someone being switched on. Because I imagine people may be watching this and they feel, they feel inspired and feel alive with it. And then they go into their life and things get in the way of that. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if there's any clues you can give towards some of what those, those obstacles might be. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think the combination of belief, negative belief, well, I say negative, limiting belief. Um, and um, some kind of fear-based emotion. Mm. And those two often live, you know, they're, they're pest piece really one thing. Sure. Um, and then there's a reaction, a physical reaction. That's, that's the head, hand, heart thing. So we have these little kind of complexes um, that I call in my book pain, pattern, and crystals. Um, little crystals that form. So they must have been very tiny at the beginning. Uh, a little, you know, a look from my dad. Uh, or from your mum or from your teacher or from someone that gave a little bit of fear and then there was a little reaction defense against it. That little tiny micro thing has become a crystal um, and they live within us. And we have, often have a number of these things. Um, that's why the work is continuous because there's mm-hmm. oh, God, no, something else I've got to dissolve away. And the reason I use crystal metaphor is, is a, so I do believe that the way to get by them is, is to break through them or to dissolve them. Um, and that is basically letting go, surrender. Um, and actually, this is interesting in the way I work in, as an uh, innovation consultant, a creative consultant. I used to think that my work was always about helping companies have ideas, the big ideas. And now I realize 95% of my work, whether it's personal coaching work or healing or teaching or co- corporate work, is helping people let go of the things that are in the way. Mm. Because the ideas are always there. They're, they're, right. they're just sitting there. The insights and ideas, every human being needs to thrive are in them. Because you're part of the system which is mm. inherently wise and intelligent. Um, so it's really about letting go. And, and that is, is the, the, the great challenge of the human experience. Um, and, um, and I think if you find, uh, if you do a scan of your body in a sense, any moment of the day, and you find there's a little bit of a squirrely somewhere, that is a sign that there's some activated crystal right there mm. in that moment. If you have a thought which is, um, as I put it, you know, you, you're an idiot or I'm an idiot, you know, some, some thought mm-hmm. which essentially puts a comparison mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. Um, between, you know, a split between me and you, that again is another clue that you're, that's a barrier. Um, yes. And if there's some physical fight-flight type pattern, um, which obviously well, not so much, obviously, over time can actually become uh, our posture mm-hmm. because it gets so hardened in, um, then that's another clue. So, so if physical pain, clue number one, um, and sort of some kind of al- alignment, headaches, backache, the, mm-hmm. great, uh, the great messenger, um, research saying 80% of backache has no understandable mechanical me- mm-hmm. medical cause. Mm-hmm. So physical pain in your hands is, is, is a there's something going on here. Let's go and switch on and find out. Um, some belief which is um, putting someone down, and it could be you. Um, often is you. Um, that's another one. Oh, addiction is obviously mm-hmm. another physical sign. And then the th- third one is some fear uh, uh, somewhere in this mm-hmm. in this field. And usually, it's usually in the torso. So yes. somewhere in here. Um, and those are nature's genius uh, flags. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's something to let go of. 
If you choose to use them that way. If you choose yeah. to use them that way. And yeah. that is the, that's like the mega switch. Yeah. I talk about the master switch in my book. So the yeah. master switch is basically, this, I have this image of this big sort of, you know, those sort of light uh, switches in theatres that are like kind of mm. on or off, massive yeah, yeah. sort of things. And your master switch is basically, do you believe that everything that happens to you is an opportunity to grow, become more one, become more whole, become more loving? Or do you believe that everything is basically there to fuck you over? And those are basically, mm -hmm. you've got the choice. And the right. thing is, what most of us like to do is switch the up and on. So yeah. when I met that girl in the club, it was fate. It was beautiful. It was amazing. The switch was on. Yeah. Oh, but when I had an accident with my bike and I had a broken arm, that switch was off. That shouldn't mm -hmm. have happened. It was some yeah, awful, you know, the world's against me. And that's the inconsistency. Yes. So you've just got to choose. It do, is my life a life that's where the switch is always on? And therefore, I will try my, everything I will use as an opportunity to, to become more. Yes. Um, or do I want to blame somebody mm -hmm. for something? Um, I was going to say, just what, there's a point on that which I use, which is really to, to make this very, very real for people. So I'm a, a grandson of two Holocaust survivors. So uh, they both escaped um, the German you know, onslaught. And so I don't teach stuff that I don't think can work in really difficult, intense situations, including uh, camps, uh, uh, Holocaust, mm. you know, concentration camps, where a third of my family w you know, ended their life. So um, I, would, I won't teach anything until I put it through that test myself. Yes. Could the, if I was in this situation, or if I was a child that had been, uh, was being abused, is, is this something that could help me? And um, there's an amazing book, which uh, every human being should read, um, Viktor Frankl, Man's mm. Search for Meaning, where it has a paragraph, which I quote in the book, which basically says, the fact that there are a few people not many, but a few in a concentration camp who could use it as an opportunity to be of service, to be uh, compassionate and caring for someone else is proof that you, everyone can, essentially. Yes. That's why I take it to mean. Yeah. Um, and so we can always switch on. Yeah. We're out of time. Nick, thank you very much. Thank you. Really enjoyed that. Thank you. And thank you for watching. And we look forward to talking to you again here on Conscious Tea very soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.